uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the, the invited speaker here, Tor Hester. Um, he's pretty much single-handedly authored everything I use in my work <laughs> in Netflix. Uh, so I'm very grateful. Uh, my name is Antonio Molins. Uh, I am a manager on the marketing algorithm and analytics here at Netflix, and I'll be talking later. Uh, but I think you guys came to see Trevor, so without further ado. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm not. <laughs> um, unlike you guys, I'm not used to dealing with this traffic in, in this part of the world. I cycle to work on campus at Stanford. So um, this was a nightmare getting here. Anyway, here I am. And first of all, I'm not single handedly responsible for this work. I have lots of colleagues, especially uh, Roxette Shirani and Jerome Friedman. And uh, in fact, GBM, which is what we come to later on, was, was largely due to Joe and Peter. So this, this, is, this doesn't look like a real talk, this is a title or anything. But uh, this is part of a course at Rock Tip and I teach, and so I just pulled out the part on ensemble learners. Um, and so you can see you've already done classification trees, so we just move on from there. And I'm going to tell you about uh, bagging, random forest, and then that leads into boosting. So we're going to look at a tree in a moment, and you know, there's, trees have got lots of nice properties. You know, they can handle huge data sets, can handle mixed predictors, you know, categorical and continuous features. They can ignore redundant variables, so they can do variable selection. Can handle missing data, um, and uh, for small trees, they're easy to interpret. But the big problem with trees, apart from all these nice features of trees, is large trees are hard to interpret and prediction performance of trees is very poor. Right? So that's kind of bad news for trees. This is a somewhat bushy tree, um, fit to the spam uh, data that we have in our book. Um, uh, just, you've seen trees before. And I'm gonna, some of these slides aren't really uh, specific here, so I'm just gonna uh, skip through. So this is a toy classification problem, two-dimensional problem got the red class largely in the middle, the green class surrounding it. Um, uh, the, the black boundary, you can see that this is a generative model here. So the black, if you can see the black boundary there, that's actually the Bayes decision boundary. If you knew the generating mechanism, so for this toy example, that's what we're trying to get at. Um, and it, it, um, that's the best you can do in this problem. There is some overlap, and, and the error is 25%. That's the best you can do. And so we want to build a classifier to get that. Um, and here's a similar example where there's no overlap in the classes. It's a so-called deterministic problem. Here the Bayes error rate is zero. So in the noisy case, it's 25%. In this case, it's zero. And so we put a classification tree to that problem. And you get what you expect, a boxy kind of uh, decision boundary. Right? Because trees have axis-oriented splits. In this case, they're just two variables. So a tree is not going to be do particularly well. This is the noiseless case. This is the determinist, so-called deterministic problem where the best you can do is zero errors. And this tree gets 73%, um, uh, uh, sorry, 7.3% uh, 7 errors. Um, and, and if you take this problem from two dimensions up to 10 dimensions, the error rate goes up to 30%. So that's not doing very well. So the techniques we're going to talk about use trees as building blocks or so-called wheat learners and boost their performance. And the three approaches that are really popular today are bagging and, and, and random forest really go hand in hand and boosting. And I, they listed here in the time order in which they were invented. But you can really think of random forest as being, uh, uh, as bagging as being part of the random forest family. And in general, in terms of performance, boosting dominates random forest, which dominates bagging, and they all dominate a single tree. In terms of ease of use, random forests are a bit easier to use than boosting. Okay. So I'll just quickly go through bagging. It's a very simple idea. The idea of bagging is, is the following. I'll leave the text up there. Uh, maybe I'll show you a picture of it, actually. The idea with bagging is you build a really bushy tree 
um, and this is also the idea of random forest. You build a really bushy tree. In other words, you keep on splitting till you get down to the, the terminal nodes um, when you got, till you've got about one or two very small number of observations in the terminal nodes. Let me just step back here. I'm just assuming everyone knows about a tree. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, and such a tree will be relatively, will have low bias, right? Because you've split down very finely. You've gone down to very small regions in, in the predictor space. But it's very noisy, but very high variance. So the idea is, if you could get a whole lot of independent trees of that kind, you could average them and reduce the variance. What's it mean to average a tree? Suppose we, we, we try to predict a probability of, of a, um, a two-class problem. We want to predict the probability of a, of a positive outcome. You go down a single tree. At the, in the terminal node, you get a very rough estimate of the probability, given the feature values that you've got, um, of, of a one, let's say, probability of a one. Very noisy, because there's only about there's maybe only one, maybe two or three observations in that terminal node. Um, so it's got high variance. So now you, you pass this test feature down all your trees. You've got a whole lot of these trees, and they're all somehow independent of each other. Each one of them gives an estimate of the probability, and you average those estimates, bring down the variance. You average independent things, the variance goes down as 1 over n. Well, that's all good and well, but how do we get lots of independent trees? Well, we can't really. But what the idea of Bryman was to do bootstrap resampling of the training data. So in other words, you take samples of size, let's say the original training data had n observations, you take samples size n with replacement. And so that sort of shakes up the training data a little bit, and you grow trees to each of those. And they're not independent, but they're somewhat decorrelated. You average them, that brings the variance down. So it's a great idea. Um, sort of, it, it was also around in the bootstrap literature for a while. So Baggin does a pretty good job in this toy example. You can see how the averaging of noisy boxes gives you a, a much smoother approximation to the decision boundary there. So that's just a nice uh, picture of, of how that works. So this is great. Random forest came along um, a few years later. Um, the reason for random forest was when you do Baggin, the bootstrap sampling doesn't decorrelate the trees enough. They're still too much, they're still too similar to each other. So Leo Bryman again thought, well, we want to we want to add some additional noise to make these trees different, more different from each other. So the way you do that with random forest, after taking your new bootstrap sample, when you go to split grow the tree, let's suppose you've got p variables at your disposal. Instead of using all p variables each time, you take a random subset of m of those variables. And m can be quite small. You know, p could be 100 features or variables. And you could take a subset of size 7, say, of those variables, just at random. And then you, you confine your search for a split variable amongst those 7. So given the identical bootstrap resampling of the data, you could grow two, you could grow two different random forest trees, and they'd be completely different because they pick different variables to split them. So you can see that decorrelates the trees more. They become more different from each other. And because they're more decorrelated, when you average them, you bring down the variance even more. So it's a great idea. The M is a tuning parameter for random forest. So, so that's really the story with random forest. There's another nice little piece about random forest. And that is, you get a free estimate of error, the out-of-bag error rate. It's a wonderful idea. The idea is this. Suppose, suppose you were going to do um, leave one out cross-validation with random forests. What would you do? You would take an observation out of your training set. You'd run the random forest on the, the remaining data, which is n minus 1 points. And you'd predict the 1 point you left out. And you do that for each point left out. Right? That sounds like a lot of work. Well, with random forest, you could get it all for free. Because that, what the out of bag does, it says, oh, this tree actually was grown on a data set that didn't include observation i. So you, you, 
you, you, you look along and see which trees didn't involve observation I, and you just average them. And then make the prediction for this observation I. But that, all, that information is all available once you've just grown one big random forest. So as, as, as long as you might grow enough trees in the random forest, ideally infinitely many trees, right? Then this is an exact statement, what I'm saying. But as long as you grow enough, you get in leave one out cross validation for free, which is what they call the out of bag error. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Um, this is just showing performance of... of um, so there's a bunch of slides on random forest showing the, the effect of... Um, this, this actually shows you... This is a measure of the correlation between trees um, as you change the, the sample size in a random forest. So you see you pick in M is 1, 4, 7, 10, etc. So this is how the correlation <coughs> changes. So, the, so you can see it increases. And you have to think about how do you measure the correlation between trees. Well, it's, what you're going to do is you're going to actually you're going to take particular prediction point x's, points of prediction. You're going to run them down the tree. And now you have two trees. Each of them makes a prediction. And you're going to look at that's a pair. You're going to be looking at the correlation between those pairs. And it's, it's the sampling correlation. So anyway, so this, the less the correlation, the, the more reduction you get in, 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 in variance by averaging these trees, bias increases. So there is actually a bias variance trade-off with random forest. And there's pictures of this kind in our book. And so I'm going to actually skip that one. We, I, I want us to get on to boosting. Okay. I'll just leave this up while I just make the final point about random forest. It's all about variance reduction. This choosing M does add a little bit of bias, but the whole idea of random forest is you grow a really big bushy tree that's got high variance but low bias, and you get rid of the, the variance by averaging. Because the trees are identically distributed. Every single tree is identically distributed. Right? So that's pretty much all you could do by, by doing the averaging. <coughs> now, boosting seems at face value to be a rather similar idea, but it operates in quite a different way. So I'm going to present boosting as it was first presented by Freund and Shapira um, in, in the mid-90s, and then I'm going to talk it around from, in, in, and, and then explain it from the point of view that we like, which leads to gradient boosting. So the idea with, um, the original idea was you'd also grow a series of trees, and average things to get your prediction. And boosting was originally de uh, defined for two class classification. Right? And, and the response was coded as minus one and plus one. And the idea is, so, so this, is, this is a weighted average of trees, right? And you think of this, each CM, it's a, it's a classifier really, but it's a tree. You pass X down, you get a classification. Right? And uh, this classification is going to come back with a plus one or a minus one. And so you're going to, do a weighted average of these guys, and so you're going to get a score that's positive or negative, right? a continuous score, and, and you'll classify as, as a plus one if it's positive, and otherwise a minus one. Right? So in a sense, this is, a, this is very similar to random forest, average in trees. But the thing is, these trees aren't IID. Right? So what you do is, as you, as you grow in trees, you look to see how the... the, the the trees that you've grown so far are performing on the training data, and then you grow new trees to to uh, resampled versions of the training data or reweighted versions of the training data, and the reweighting is done in such a way as to fix up the errors that you've made so far. So, very somewhat different from uh, from from random forests. Okay. So I'll just give you some examples. Um, this is, these examples are all using those nested sphere problems that I, I showed you earlier. Um, here's, for example, bagging. And this, the, what we're showing you is test error as a function of number of trees in the ensemble. And this is just plain bagging, and this is um, at a boost. And you can see it does, it does quite a bit better there. Um, here's the precise algorithm for, for at a boost. 
well, expressed as a reweighted uh, sample each time. And so <coughs> you run through the number of steps, each of these is, um, gives you a new tree. So you're going to fit a classifier to the training data, and the training data's got weights. And so you're going to, each iteration, you're going to assign, reassign weights to the training data. Um, given this new weighted tree, you compute the weighted error of the new tree. Right? So this is just, it's a weighted training error. Right? So if you look at, if you get break through all of this, there are the weights, it's a weighted average. And this is just indicator of whether y is not equal to the class if it's making an error or not. So it's a weighted error. Then you compute this strange constant over here. This looks like the log odds of the error. Um, you can see if this, actually if this error is 50%, uh, this quantity will be zero. And then you update the weights. So you had some weights, you update the weights using this strange constant. And basically, if the observation was misclassified, you increase its weight. And if it was correct, classified correctly, the weight will end up being decreasing because you renormalize the weights to sum to one. So this sort of makes explicit in, in Adaboost how you reweight the points that you misclassified. Um, so that when you grow the next classifier, you can pay more attention to them. What's really interesting is that this reweighting, actually, if you, once you've done this reweighting, if you go back to the classifier that you've just grown, this tree that you've just grown, it would have 50% errors on the training data, weighted errors. So the weighting makes that problem as hard as possible for the tree you've just grown. Right? So that's kind of a neat fact. Anyway, this, this is all kind of mystical. This is the Adaboost algorithm, and it works so darn well. Um, and here was the other surprise when this first came out, stumps. So you don't need to grow big bushy trees like with random forests. You can grow very small trees, and a stump is just a tree with a single split. Right? So it's just a two terminal node tree, does really well. Right? On, on those, problem, those earlier problems, a single stump would do nothing. Right? It, would, it wouldn't make any dent in that nested spheres problem. But when you boost with stumps, drive the error rate down. Um, I'll skip this. Well, actually I won't. Uh, this shows training error and test error. So we see the test error going down. The training misclassification error goes down, and it becomes zero at, oops, it becomes zero at some point, but the test error keeps on going down as you, in, as you this tells you that clearly boosting is not training to, to minimize misclassification error. It's got some other loss function in mind. Otherwise, it would just stop you because it would be doing perfectly well here. The lot of, uh, you know, boosting has a reputation for never overfitting. That's not true. You know, if the problem's noisy enough, boosting will overfit. Overfit means after a certain amount of time, the errors start getting worse. Right? So it's fitting the training data too close. It's easy to come up with examples where that's the case. Okay, so now I'm going to get to the point where we try and explain what boosting is doing in a way that we can generalize it, and that will lead to great boosting. So first of all, boosting is fitting an additive model. Right? That was evident if we go back to the original Adaboost. Uh, there, for example, this is an additive model. It's a sum of functions. Right? Um, each of these functions is a tree, but you can think of it as a function of x. x is your input feature. Right? So it's a function. And, and we, we learn those functions, and, and the, the model is a sum of functions. Right? And so here I'm writing those functions in a more generic form. Right? Think of them as basis functions. We've got some coefficients in front of them. And there's some parameters that describe those basis functions. Right? In the case of a tree, those parameters are the, the split variables and the split points and the values in the terminal nodes. Right? So that those all describe those basis functions. But they function. Right? And so this makes us look like a statistical model. We do things like this all the time. Right? So if you know some of these models, generalize additive models, fit models that are sums of functions. Usually they functions of individual coordinates. 
in the feature vector. But more generally, basis expansions, we, we do spline basis expansions, polynomial basis expansions. Those are functions of this kind, and we fit models of that kind to the data. Now, traditionally, when we fit models of this kind, we specify the form of the model, and we fit all the parameters jointly. We maximize the likelihood, we minimize squared error loss, or something like that. To the training data, we fit all the parameters jointly. That's one big departure with boosting, is that the parameters are fit in a stage-wise fashion. With boosting, at each stage, we've got a current model, which is a sum of, say, k trees. We don't touch those. We just add a new tree. And the new tree is knows about the past, right? But we don't change the parameters in the past. So we call that stage-wise fitting. It's a slower kind of learning than fitting everything jointly. What that's going to buy for you is that you're going to overfit less quickly. And that's part of the reason why we think boosting doesn't overfit that quickly. It tends to take a long time before it overfits. is because you have this kind of slow form of fitting. So I'm going to give you a, a, now a version of boosting. It looks way different from added boost, but there's arguments that, that this is it's rather similar. This is for what we call... Um, uh, these squares boosting. So this is when you've got a quantitative response, continuous response, um, and we want a version of boosting for that. Right? So it's a, we put in a, it's a regression problem, and boosting is really simple in that case. What you do is you start off and your function is zero, um, and so your residual is just y on the training data. And then what you do is you fit, say, a tree, say, using cart or whatever tree algorithm you like, a regression tree, to R to give you some function g of x. Right? So that'll be a tree. You then possibly shrink it down by a factor epsilon. So you shrink it towards zero. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then you update your model by adding that in. So your fm was defined to be the shrunken tree you've just grown. You Augment, you augment your model, you add that in, right? And you, you downdate the residuals. So you, basically what you're doing here is you're keeping on, you're growing trees to the residuals and add that into your model. Now you get a new residual, you grow a tree to that, add it into the model. So you keep on fitting the residuals with these little trees. And little, I say little because with boosting we're going to use typically trees that only have between one and six splits. Right? So they're generally small trees. Right? So you fit a very crude model to the residual, update the residuals, and keep on going. And your function now becomes the sum of all these trees. Right? So that's a very simple idea. Um, and again, it's stage-wise fitting. You don't fix up the trees you've built so far um, when you grow your new tree. So epsilon is a shrinkage parameter which slows down the fitting even further. And so here's a cartoon of that. Um, this would be, say, test error without shrinkage. With shrinkage, it'll slow down how fast you get to the minimum because you, you're not adding the full strength of the tree in. But it'll allow you, in many cases, to get much lower. And the way of thinking of that is, you know, these trees are quite aggressive. They fit in a certain number of parameters or degrees of freedom each time they go to fit. And they're trying to fix up where your model currently isn't doing so well. Right? Um, you don't want to use up your degrees of freedom too fast. So this shrinkage slows that down. Right? You only get a partial effect of your tree, so you use less degrees of freedom. It means that the next tree, there's more data left for the next tree to, to look around. And it might pick a different tree. Right? So, so that's the idea of the shrinkage. Okay. So where we got so far, so I've told you about adder boost, and I've told you about a version of boosting for squared error loss, right, which is just simply fitting residuals. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a framework where all of this comes out in a, in a sort of natural way. So before I do that, first let me tell you that um, if you do an analysis of the adder boost algorithm, you can see that that function that Adam Boost was fitting, right, that was positive or negative, is actually a logistic regression model. 
it's fitting a logistic regression model for the, the probability of y equals one given x. It's a three-class classification problem. So that's not too hard to, to see. And it's, you can also show that it's doing stage-wise fitting using a particular loss function, the exponential loss function. It's not a loss function we were used to seeing in statistics. Right? Remember, um, f of x is going to be positive or negative. Um, so y is also positive or negative. So this is the margin, what's called the margin. If this margin is positive, you classify incorrectly. So e to the minus that is going to be small. If the margin is negative, you misclassify. And then it's e to the minus, minus is big, right? So it's like a loss function. Um, and it turns out that this particular choice of loss function leads to that reweighting algorithm of Adam. Very convenient loss function because it gets expressed um, in, when you when you um, when you grow the tree using well in, in the framework of um, of, of Adam boost it turns out that that leads to a, a reweight. So um, this is a picture that's in our book and it, it actually compares that this shows too many loss functions unfortunately there's that margin. Um, this purple is the exponential loss, and what's nice here is you can you can look at other loss functions on the, in the same representation, and you see that that the binomial log likelihood, which is a loss function, is what well, that's the orange one. So it's very similar to the exponential down at this end, but up at this end, this is the this is the point here zero where you where you go from. Um, classifying correctly to misclassifying, right? as you cross through zero here. In the correct classification part, um, the exponential and binomial look very similar. But to the left here, the exponential goes up exponentially, and actually the binomial goes off linearly, ultimately. Right? And that's actually a negative for, for the exponential loss and, and adaboos, because you know it's a, it leads to a little bit you know, overreaction to misclassification errors with the exponential loss. And thrown in for fun is the hinge loss of support vector machines in the same picture. You can see they all have a similar function, similar um, flavor. So this led us, um, Friedman and, and Tip Schrad and myself, to, to, to actually to, uh, to think of using other loss functions for boosting. And in particular, could you boost using a binomial loss function? Or deviance, as it's called. And you can. Um, and so there was a bit of a story, but it eventually led to gradient boosting. And so now I'm going to uh, tell you a general framework where you can implement the boosting idea. And in this framework, you've got a loss function, and you've got a weak learner or way of, of, of estimating a, a simple uh, set of basis, a s simple basis function, that for our case it's going to be a tree, um, in a forward stage-wise manner. And it's going to generalize this, this whole thing. And if, if you use the, the exponential loss of Adaboost, you get back Adaboost. But you get back a whole lot of other things that, uh, as well. And so the idea is, there's your loss function, whatever it is. Um, there's your response. It's a sum over the n observations. It's stage-wise. So you've got a current model, which is fm minus 1, right, with m minus 1 terms. And what you're interested in is updating that current model with a new weak learner or basis function that you're going to learn. You maybe have a coefficient in front of it. Right? So there's parameters here, which is gamma and beta. You know, the simple update that you're going to make to the function. And you want to pick these parameters to minimize, to, to give you the maximum improvement in your loss function over fm minus 1. Right? So that's step one, is you're going to estimate these guys. And then you're going to update fm by adding that guy in. Right? And you're just going to repeat that. Right? So that's a, that's a general framework. Now you can use any loss function you like. You can use... You, you know, you can use a binomial uh, negative 
log like it or deviance. You can use a um, you can use a hinge loss if you want. You can use you can use robust loss, loss functions. For squared error loss, you can use a humorized loss function if you want something that's more robust to, to outline. So it opens a door to a, a lot of a lot of possibilities by having this general loss. You can also include the shrinkage term when you shrink down the contribution before you add it in. Okay. So, so that's the general framework. Now, gradient boosting is a particular implementation of this framework. And I'll tell you in words what gradient boosting does. It says, okay, how do I actually estimate this guy? So what it does is it says, well, I start off with fm minus 1. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the gradient of the loss function at my current model. And that's going to give you an n vector of these gradients. In the case of squared error loss, it actually gives you the residual vector from your current model. And then what gradient boosting does says, well, I'd like to do gradient descent, but this is a very noisy gradient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate this noisy gradient by using a regression tree. So I'm going to fit this gradient and approximate it by a regression tree, which is a very, uh, you know, it's a much better behaved function. It's just got a few parameters. Right? And then I'll go down, uh, then I'll, I'll go down the gradient using that approximation to the gradient. That exactly corresponds, in the case of squared error loss, to fitting a tree to the residual. Right? And so that's what gets done in gradient boosting to estimate this piece over here. If it's a tree to the gradient, and uh, and that's available for for the next step. Okay. So this is a summary of that. Um, all right. Okay. So I'm not going to go into any more detail. That that's what's implemented in the GBM package in, in R gradient boosting, which I use a lot. This is the, for example, in in, in Jeff's talk we. Uh, that's the version that you implement. Ah, uh, it's from your book. Yeah, um, it's, it's the same. It's the same. I'll show you the, yeah. the page. Yes, yeah. Okay. So before I finish, I just want to show you some things. So, um, okay. So this is on, on the spam data years, bagging random forests and, and gradient boosting. Um, and you see the this one below you is gradient boosting. This is on the test data in the in the spam data set. Um, there's actually, you know, there's a bit of noise here. If this is relatively small test data set, so you know, these, even though this is below, it's it's not statistically, a statistically significant difference. Um, and so, um, gradient on the spam data is, is gives the results. So gradient boosting gets 4.5 percent, um, random 4.75 random We revise those. Just a couple of other things that come along with, with the territory is variable importance, which is nice. In the original card book, there was a notion of variable importance, which was based on which variables were involved in the split, splitting and how much of a change in the loss did they produce each time they split. And so what happens here is you just accumulate those over all the trees in random forests or in, in gradient boosting. And so you can get a, a relative measure of importance of each of the variables, and that tends to be useful. Um, you get partial dependence plots. I'm going to skip through this. This is, this, well, I'll just show you this. These are some data with a quantitative response, and we see um, two versions of random forest versus two versions of, of gradient boosting, and it seems gradient boosting is on track to do much better here. These are all test error. These plots are test error against the number of trees in the ensemble. Okay, a couple of more uh, to wrap up a few important features. Tree size. So I was rather cavalier in saying you only need you know between um, one and, and six splits. Okay. Well, the, the argument behind that is that tree size actually um, determines the interaction order of your model. And in general, we don't believe you need very high-order interaction models. And so that's why 
and then in a very deep tree. Well, that's the feeling anyway. So think about if you grow uh, stumps which have a single split, each tree only involves one variable. So if you take your whole ensemble of, of trees and collect all those that split on variable x1, all those that on x2, and so on, you've got an additive model. You've got a sum of functions of individual variables. There's no interactions there. On the other end, if you have two splits, each tree involves at most two variables. So it's a second-order interaction model, and so on. So that's kind of handy in, in our nested spheres problem. The, the optimal decision boundary is, is this, the surface of a sphere, which is, of course, an additive decision boundary because the quadratic equation. And so Stumps does really well there. And this is a picture that actually shows the performance of this adder boost. And Stumps is the blue curve. And you see Stumps eventually does much better, or a little bit better, than 10 node trees, which do better than 100 node trees. And that's because... These other trees are fitting higher order interactions where they're not needed, and so it's going to eventually cost you a price invariance. Okay, one last little concept which is, I think, quite important. One of, one of the complaints of, of using um, boosting and random forests in the industry is that you've got this complex model at the end of the day. Right? It may be perform quite well, but Don, I've got, I've got a model that's got 6,000 trees, which, by the way, isn't a necessarily a very large number of trees. You know, so I've got to somehow encode that to make a predictive model, and that takes a, you know, you know just takes, could take a long time for lookup. So there's one way of going a step further than that, and that is you say, well, okay, I've got this collection of, of trees now. Um, I know some of them are going to be very similar. Can I thin the set down? Um, and so the idea is to use these trees, you think of them as a collection now of variables in a regression, a linear regression model. And I'm going to play around with their coefficients. So I'm going to actually post hoc go back and do what I said I wasn't going to do earlier and then refit the coefficients of these guys. But I'm going to do it in a special way. I'm going to actually use. Um, the lasso, which does L1 regularization, and will do severe um, variable selection, will set a lot of those coefficients of trees to zero, and thereby reduce the set. Okay? So you can do this with the ensemble of trees that you get from boosting or from random forests. So you've got this big set, you now run a lasso. You think of those variables as, as, as each of them as predictive variables in a model. What you actually have to do is you run the training data down each of the trees and you get a vector which is the values that you get in the terminal nodes that's going to be an n vector so you think of that as a feature vector right? that's the function that that tree defines you stack them all together and and now you you run the lasso so there's a tuning parameter there's an l1 uh, penalty on each of the coefficients as you run down the lasso path you're setting coefficients to zero or they, they in fact as you run down the path, they, they, they start becoming non-zero. And, and that will both um, save you a lot of trees. Let me see. This was... Okay, so this demonstration uses random forests. So this is a particular random forest right, with, with 500 trees. Um, let's see. So this is the performance. This horizontal line is a performance of a random forest with 500 trees. This purple line is a performance of gradient boosting on, on these data. This is a spam data. This blue curve here is the performance of this post-process lasso on the trees. And from the random forest, and you can see by about 50 trees, it's got down to the performance roughly of, of the boosting, using far fewer trees. So this post-processing is, is a good idea for, for reducing the number of <coughs> Okay, the software is out of date, so I'll leave, I'll, I'll stop there. So 
So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So can you fit a uh, potentially infinite number of trees um, to, say, a, a data set that you don't have that many observations? For example, let's say you were dealing with monthly observations and <coughs> looking at 10 years of monthly observations. You have 150 observations and you may have who knows how many variables. Uh, oh, well, you're, you're, not gonna, you're, you're gonna, um you're going to run into trouble. I mean, you're going to have high variance. Um, you know, with thousands of variables these, and, and so few observations, you're not, you don't expect to do necessarily that well, unless some of those variables really stand out. Okay, so, so then yeah. even, so basically, if you if you have a small number of op, no, number of observations, then basically, it's it, 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 it's tough no matter what you do. Right, because. With a small number of observations and lots of variables, you're going to, you know, when you build a tree to training data, you're going to pull in some of the wrong variables, for sure, and that's going to add variance. So you're going to get a high variance, weak learner, and bagging and random forests aren't going to bring it down. I see. Yeah. In your uh, slide right here, um, you, you basically use the uh, logistic regression, you, you cut your your count of trees down, you'll assume, sorry, down to like one tenth. Is that kind of an expected ratio? You think you might divide the model size by a factor of 10 via lasso, or is it sometimes not actually able to reduce things? You no, know, you usually cut it down quite a lot. Yeah, it's not always going to be that amount. Okay. Know? But you definitely get a reduction. Right? And I haven't seen an example where the lasso doesn't do as, you know, as well as the original model. It always gets it'll always get as good performance as the original model. In this case, it's a random forest. We, we've really got a beat here. Right? Right. So you can see it, it. it's getting pretty much safely below the random forest. I wouldn't say, yeah, it's safely below yet. It seems to wiggle around a bit. Yeah, it looks pretty safe. But, uh, you know, but if your goal is just to reduce the number of trees, you know, I think it pretty much always does that. You know, and sometimes gives you better performance. <clears throat> so, what do you think of the idea of uh, <clears throat> incorporating the, you know, the random forest uh, feature uh, bagging idea into uh, boosting? Oh, yes. So, there's, there's lots of bells and whistles in boosting, and that's one of them. Um, so, do a bit, of, uh, a bit of randomization of the training data. In fact, the GBM package in R does that for you if you want it. You know, it's something you can switch on and off. Um, and so, you know, so then you're getting a little bit of variance reduction via bagging, right? Whereas you're getting some bias reduction via boosting. Yeah, you know, so when we do gradient descent, you know, we, we normally um, have a parameter that we're trying to estimate, right? Here the parameter is the whole function, right? And so, in, on the training data, the parameter vector is the function evaluated at each of the, the training features, the end train. So it's an n vector of parameters. Well, that's too many parameters. It's a noisy um, parameter, right? And so you wouldn't do too well if you did try to do gradient descent on that. Right? I mean, that's essentially in the squared error loss, we saw that was the residual. Well, in one step, you could make that residual zero. So the idea is that's too noisy. And so you smooth it. And the way we smooth it here is fit a tree to it. But it's not like a degree matrix of quasi neutron Sorry, the way the quasi neutron matrix, like the VD matrix, which takes the last few ish gradient calls and try to fit the model. Well, this is just a pure gradient. Yeah. Oh, okay. So in this case, it's yeah. noise, so we should not do this. You 
could think of making modifications to that, but this 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 is a simple idea of doing gradient descent, but uh, but smoothing that gradient. You know that gradient you can think of as a very noisy function over feature space. So now, uh, and when you grow a tree over feature space, you're smoothing it, you're making it piecewise constant. So, um, in uh, talking about bugging, uh, when training GBMs in R, uh, you have already explained that how the uh, depth of the tree really signifies like the amount of interactions that you are putting in there. But how do you think about the percentage of bugging uh, when training? How do I think about trying to get only 50% of the data set in bagging in every iteration versus 75 ah, in training? I see. So, are you thinking of like to sub bagging? Right, so, so when I train in a GBM, yeah. in R, I do a parameter search yeah. on the percentage yeah. that is used for bagging. Yes. And I do notice differences in performance, ah. but I don't have an intuition as to. Well, so that's another thing you can do, both with bagging and boosting, mm -hmm. right? and or random forest and boosting, is you can take subsamples of the data. So, in other words, don't take a bootstrap sample size in in bagging or random forest, but take a bootstrap subsample, right. Right? And, and actually have a smaller training set. Right. So that'll decorrelate the trees just fine. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, I think if you take like a 50% um, subsample without replacement, it's, it's, it's been argued that that's somehow equivalent to taking a bootstrap sample of size n. But now you've got half the sample size and much less work to do. Yeah. Yeah. So there are, you can play these, these games. Yeah. yeah, can you speak to the relative performance of random forest and uh, stochastic gradient boosting when it comes to um, um, Junk features, lots yeah. of irrelevant features in your in your training set, and the resistance to those. Yeah, um, I think the main, you know, the performance is is, is very similar. Um, the, the main thing with uh, with random forest is that the, the 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 extent to which it gets rid of the bias or, or you know, gets rid of the, um, the approximate how well it approximates a function, is determined by a single tree, right? the depth of a single tree. And all it can do is variance reduction. And whereas, whereas boosting is, is constantly trying to eat up what we call the bias, it's trying to get rid of the um, reducible error. Um, and random forest is limited in that regard. Um, So, but along that, there's a, a sort of variant on bagging that Raymond talked about called by voting, right? Where you essentially do some sort of acceptance sampling. Um, you basically, when you sample, you run it through all the, the learners or trees you built, right? And then if it's mostly misclassified, you keep it, and otherwise you reject it with some probability. Um, shouldn't that also end up eating a lot of the bias without some of the complexity? Well, yeah, yeah, so that's different, right? That's more like boosting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm actually, I, I'd heard of that, I've forgotten about it, you know, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that is different. It's, um, the, the, the random forest that I think is, is popular today is the one that's the independent one, um, partly because it's so easy to use. Yeah. Right? One of the, I, I didn't mention that, but with boosting you have a bunch of things to worry about. You can decide when to stop fitting, right? that's one of the tuning parameters. You have to decide the depth of the tree how many splits to make, and you have to decide how much to shrink. And each of those plays a role, right? They can be important. With random forests, you have to decide on M, the number of splitting variables you pick, and that's pretty much it. You just keep on fitting until the outer bag error stabilizes, and it won't overfit. Random forest will not overfit, so if you add too many trees, it doesn't matter. It just stays flat. So. It's easier to work with random forest, yeah. less tinkering. Yeah, I have a very general question. Are there any limitations to random forest? Are there any cases of conditions where you cannot apply this method? Oh yeah, lots. 
Um, for example, people, you know, when you've got nice tools like this, people will use them on every problem in sight. So one problem where I haven't seen great success of random forest and boosting is in genomic problems. In, in genomic problems, you typically got relatively small sample sizes and huge numbers of features. Right? These methods don't do that well. They rather work on, 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 on tall data than, than on wide data. But would it, would it work where, imagine you A little, that's a tough question. I mean, I don't know. I mean, those, already the, those data are somewhat more complex. Yeah, because uh, I'm trying to understand whether, you know, data which are One thing you can do always um, is, if, if you're interested in fitting an autoregressive model. Yeah, that's, so, that's what we do. Right, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna <coughs> fit today's response on a lag set of your previous exactly. data, well then you put yourself back in the framework of a regression problem. And so that lag set becomes your set of features, and you can throw a random forest at it, and it'll, it'll do a good job. So you can yeah, do that. That's one of the lines yeah. that, that we work on. Mm -hmm. that's, so yeah, there, that's, that's one case where you can, you can still get some mileage. If you've got a really flexible regression engine, which is what you've got here. Uh, to follow her question, uh, essentially, uh, you, you're saying to, to fit a regression model to, to lag values of the variables, so yes. the lag factors. But on the other hand, you're saying that these methods might not do so well if you're, you go from tall to wide data. So basically, there is some sort of inherent limitation to how many lags of how many features uh, you can add to your prediction model. Uh, because say uh, you, uh, you have four different variables you're trying to predict, and you have 10 different factors, so, such as econometric data. And then you take those 10 factors and you lag them by one, two, three. Suddenly you have 30 separate features instead of 10. Yeah, but if you've got a long enough time series, you know, the, number of, the number of observations can be quite low. <coughs> okay. 30 doesn't sound so frightening. Okay. But uh, 40,000 sounds frightening in genomic problems. You know, okay. 40,000 features. Yeah. Um, so just regarding the uh, I think we have a lot of uh, comparing uh, Adam Flores to uh, Baby and Jose. So, um, this is regarding the test error. So, it's sort of so the random forest that it, it uh, falls off the cliff, essentially. There's a green which is a bit small compared to the And my question is so, now, since you said uh, there are some techniques that you, if you, you could probably come up with a smaller subset or something, mm -hmm. sample, <coughs> which, could have, which could be represented. My question is, um, the, uh, the sample that random forest converged on, mm. uh, would that correspond some, in some way uh, to, uh, to what the lasso parent was in here? So the question, the reason, the reason behind is that um, since it found um, the error much sooner, it probably got a better low-level interaction minimum than um, for gradient boosting, which is finding a more complicated reason. <coughs> Not really. <laughs> 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 Sorry. 
So maybe uh, we have time for one more question, and then we'll go. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, uh, you showed that uh, for the stump, uh, it did better in this particular case because it was circular and it's quadratic. Yeah. Uh, if you, in general, if you don't know your data is like multidimensional, uh, how do you choose a, a one that is good? I usually try a few. So try a few. I'll try a stump, three splits, five splits, just to see if there's some trend going on. Yeah. Okay. But those are parameters you have to choose. And, you know, of course, you will... If you've got a, if a, a validation data set that you're using, right, you're going to end up picking one of these choices that does best, right? and you're going to pick where to stop you know, how many trees and everything. You're going, to, you're going to basically tune all these parameters on your validation set. To be really honest about it, you have to keep a, another set out yeah. and, and evaluate final performance on that set. And it's, it's amazing how easy it is to get lured into this trap of overfitting. You know, but if you're really honest about it, like eventually we were honest on the spam data, and random forest and, and boosting were somewhat indistinguishable on the step of spam data, if you're really honest.